now we talk about the diseases related with it first of all a very very basic concept all the diseases which impair which impair mainly neuromuscular transmission and produce muscular weakness that muscular weakness is painless muscular weakness patient will not complain that i have weakness in the muscles and also i'm having pain usually the diseases which produce impaired neuromuscular transmission the diseases which produce impair neuromuscular transmission produce painless weakness what kind of weakness the hallmark of all these diseases painless weakness now what are different types of neuromuscular transmission related diseases actually these diseases muscular junction transmission impairment impairment diseases the diseases which impair the or reduce the neuromuscular or produce neuromuscular junction disorders right basically number one there are autoimmune diseases autoimmune diseases in which your own immune system your own immune system produces antibodies which are directed against your neuromuscular junction components right your own immune system produces auto antibodies which interfere with the function of neuromuscular junction right and classically these are two number one is myasthenia myasthenia yes gravis a grave weakness myasthenia mean weakness and other is lambert eaton myasthenic syndrome myasthenic syndrome now in both conditions auto antibodies are produced against the component of neuromuscular junction and impair the neuromuscular transmission is that right now in myasthenia gravis in myasthenia gravis this is an autoimmune disease right in which auto antibodies are produced against in myasthenia gravis auto antibodies are produced in 85% of the patient of myasthenia gravis auto antibodies are produced against the acetylcholine receptors auto antibodies are produced against the acetylcholine receptors nicotinic receptors at neuromuscular junction because there are so many acetylcholine receptors in many other places you must signify in myasthenia gravis this is an autoimmune disease in which about 85% of the patient produce auto antibodies which are directed against nicotinic acetylcholine receptor at neuromuscular junction and how do they damage i will discuss later right how they produce the weakness secondly in 15% of patient with myasthenia gravis what really happens and other protein is damaged another antibodies are produced against another protein which regulate the acetylcholine receptor concentration at neuromuscular junction right let me show you that there is one more protein right and and this protein this is a muscle and there is a very special protein here and this protein this protein is called musk m u sk what it stand for muscle specific kinases kinases why we call this kinases because when a substance there is a special substance right we stimulate the musk protein when this musk protein is stimulated it gives the it does produce signal inside and it gives signal in which some proteins undergo phosphorylation so we call it kinases and it produces phosphorylation of tyrosine residues so that is why this is called muscle specific tyrosine kinase receptor full name should be yes muscle specific yes tyrosine tyrosine kinase receptor right so what is this and it, this protein is present where in the sarcolemma this is protein is present in sarcolemma so we can say this is sarcolemal protein of course this is present on post synaptic membrane 
it is sarcolimal protein which is muscle specific and it act as a receptor and functionally it produces kinase activity on tyrosine does that right produces kinase activity in the tyrosine so this musk protein is very important you know why because this musk protein gives the signals and this signals actually control the trafficking of these receptors you know acetylcholine receptors acetylcholine receptors at neuromuscular junction are under a slow turnover that new acetylcholine receptors are being produced and older are being internalized and destroyed normally physiologically but whatever is destroyed same is also synthesized so the concentration of cholinergic receptor at this membrane is maintained well in a healthy person but this maintenance of density of or concentration of cholinergic receptors and postsynaptic membrane is dependent or regulated by musk what is the function of the musk musk is regulating the musk is basically regulating the concentration of cholinergic receptor at neuromuscular junction or in a very simple way musk proteins or muscle specific tyrosine kinase receptors right they are responsible to make the neuromuscular junction healthy but in 15% of patient with myasthenia gravis r20 bodies are not formed against nicotinic cholinergic receptors in 15% cases r20 bodies are directed against musk proteins they are against musk proteins and when this musk proteins sarcolimal proteins become dysfunctional then mem then trafficking and clustering of these cholinergic receptor is impaired and they are being destroyed faster than or you can say they are not properly they are maintained in the membrane so those patient in which again in which musk proteins are damaged by the presence of autoantibodies musk proteins are unable or these tyrosine kinases are unable to maintain the healthy concentration of cholinergic receptors on postsynaptic membrane right and postsynaptic membrane or this component of the neuromuscular junction become dysfunctional and transmission becomes impaired is that right so what did we learn up to now that disorder of neuromuscular junction transmission number one we are talking about autoimmune disorders in autoimmune disorders antibodies are formed against the components of neuromuscular junction first we talk about the classical disease myasthenia gravis in most of the patients of myasthenia gravis there are antibodies directed against cholinergic receptors and in about 15% cases uh, auto antibodies are directed against muscle specific tyrosine kinase receptors is that right and in both cases eventually the functional cholinergic ion channels are not available in sufficient amount here right and that impairs the neuromuscular transmission <laughs> then we come to another disease that is lambert eaton myasthenic syndrome i will discuss these two and compare them later but just i'm telling you what is lambert eaton actually lambert eaton is different than myasthenia gravis there are so many differences but here i'll tell you only one major difference in lambert eaton actually auto antibodies are formed but not against cholinergic receptors not against musk proteins here the auto in these patient auto antibodies produced against the presynaptic calcium channel which calcium channels voltage sensitive calcium channel in lambert eaton what really happens person is unfortunately having circulating auto antibodies directed against presynaptic yes voltage gated calcium channel and it's very easy to understand that if auto antibodies are here and these channels become dysfunctional or reduced in number what will be the result there is impaired calcium influx and calcium dependent release of acetylcholine will be impaired and naturally neuromuscular transmission will be impaired and that reduced and that will end up again into painless weakness of the muscle right so these are two classical example in which autoimmune diseases are reducing the neuromuscular transmission then there is another group 
uh, here that these are relatively rare these are called congenital myasthenic syndromes congenital myasthenic syndromes uh, really you are not supposed to know them into detail because they are very rare but just an idea then congenital myasthenic syndrome there is no autoimmunity there, these patients have myasthenia they have weakness of the muscle and weakness of muscle is due to impairment in neuro, neuromuscular junction transmission but there are no autoantibodies that is why here immunosuppressive drugs will not work is that right here immunosuppressive drug will work if you suppress the production of autoantibodies these diseases can improve but here because there are no autoantibodies so immunosuppressive drug will not work but what is really wrong in these patients these patients have inherited defective genes which are going to make the proteins at neuromuscular junction right what is the problem here problem is here that these patients have mutations in genes genetic mutations those genes are defective which are supposed to make some presynaptic proteins or in some other patients synaptic protein or in some other patients post synaptic membrane proteins right and when those proteins are defective either suppose calcium channels are defective or some proteins in the synapse are defective or let's suppose cholinergic channels have inherited defect because these are inherited defects right so if these proteins are not attacked by autoantibodies but they are structurally defective or functionally defective and they are made like that due to inherited defect due to the mutations in their uh, genes that will end up into congenital myasthenic syndromes is that right now these syndromes again they may be due to presynaptic synaptic defect or it may be post synaptic defect no there may be synaptic synaptic proteins are defective or post synaptic synaptic proteins are defective then we come to the next next group of problems disorders which produce neuromuscular impairment that may be toxin mediated that may be toxin mediated toxin mediated yes neuromuscular junction impairment or even sometimes drugs right now toxin mediated classically i will talk about two toxins there are many but i will specially talk about two toxins number one clostridium clostridium botulinum linum toxin clostridium botulinum is a anaerogram positive anaerobic bacteria right and this bacteria is sometimes uh, it's uh, producing toxins in Im improperly home cooked food where there is aner for example home cooked canned food in which uh, if these bacterial spores are present they will germinate and produce the toxins and these toxins will be present in that food if you ingest that toxin that will absorb from the GIT blood to your circulation and then the toxin will go to extracellular fluid and eventually this toxin will be taken up by the cholinergic nerve endings and here it is taken up by neuromuscular junction nerve endings as well as autonomic nerve endings and the toxin goes inside the nerve ending and there botulinum toxin right it act as a yes scissor it act as a scissor it is a protein basically a component of this toxin is an enzyme it is a protease it's a proteolytic enzyme and you know what what it will digest it will digest synaptobrevin if synaptic synaptobrevin proteins are digested can vesicle fuse and release acetylcholine no and in this way the patient who suffer this is very highly toxic uh, highly lethal toxin one microgram is enough ingestion of just one microgram is enough to kill a human being it's so toxic right so what it is doing that this toxin is taken up by the nerve endings and its active component is actually proteolytic enzyme and this proteolytic enzyme will digest 
the calcium uh, digesters and eptoprevin and then calcium dependent fusion of vesicle with the nerve ending is impaired and there is poor release of acetylcholine and neuromuscular junction undergo dysfunction and when neuromuscular junction undergo dysfunction what will happen painless. painless weakness and this will be sudden onset of weakness in a person which was otherwise healthy just taking the toxin and patient will develop very rapidly weakness of extraocular muscles and ptosis and difficulty in talking dysarthria or dysphagia even facial paralysis and in severe cases there may be paralysis of limbs and respiratory system with autonomic disturbance with autonomic disturbance right patient may have dilated pupil or unreactive pupil with dry mouth constipation paralytic ileus right postural hypotension you are getting it all autonomic dysfunction and this is very important that uh, in these patients you have to do treatment fast especially higher amount of toxin has been taken but we will have later a full lecture on clostridium botulinum right here i have just told you what is the mechanism of clostridium botulinum how it impair the neuromuscular transmission so it it act at presynaptic component then there is another toxin curare curare tubocurarene or curare this was actually toxin well known to the native americans in uh, south america and central america uh, there they people knew that they can, they could get this toxin from plants and they were using this toxin for many purposes one of that was hunting purposes they could throw this curare in the water body and fish will get paralyzed and come on the surface and catch the fish and go home if they get good amount of fish they go to their own home if they get too much fish you know where they go okay they were also like men these days then or they could apply these uh, uh, curare on the arrowhead right and then they arrow for the animal and then animal uh, not only get wounded by the arrow but also this toxin spread in the body and animal gets paralyzed is that right and then of course they were also using in their wars poisonous tips of the arrows is that right so curare how curare work curare this is also called tubo curare tubo curarine tubo for t actually uh, how tubo curarine work tubo curarine act binds with which component post synaptic component they bind with what nicotinic cholinergic receptors and this tube tubocurare basically yes blocks the what is this cholinergic receptors right and impair neuromuscular transmission so tubocurare or curarine related compound they bind on the post synaptic membrane to be more specific on the cholinergic nicotinic receptors and block those receptors and when these receptors are blocked neuromuscular transmission is impaired am i clear so this was just an introduction to the diseases related with the neuromuscular junction you must remember number one the most important group of diseases these days is autonomic disease number two is congenital diseases number three is toxin mediated and of course a good student you should not forget there are some drugs also which impair sometimes not always but sometimes these drugs some drugs as a side effect impair the neuromuscular transmission classically yes which group amino glycosides amino glycosides this is a group of drugs like gentamicin and there are so many other gentamicin amikamicin tobramicin but out of this group gentamicin gentamicin specially not in every patient of course if it was producing paralysis in every patient then it will not be a drug it will be toxin but sometimes in some patients uh, aminoglycoside especially gentamicin that this also impairs the function of voltage gated calcium channels and release of acetylcholine become less and it produces muscular weakness or even sometimes paralysis so gentamicin then there are some other drugs which can also produce problems like that for example quinine quinine in some patients not everyone right there can be beta blockers right there can be procanamide procana mide right and there can be tetracyclines tetracyclines and many other drugs these drugs sometimes 
in some patients they impair the neuromuscular transmission most of these act at presynaptically and reduce the influx of calcium and in this way exocytosis or release of the acetylcholine and neuromuscular junction is impaired and that produces muscular weakness and of course now you understand these drugs should not be given to the patients with myasthenia gravis or other patients which are already having impaired neuromuscular transmission now let's have a break and then we're going to detail of myasthenia gravis which is our pro prototype disease in this